Grab your Bibles and let's open them to John chapter 15 today. We're going to start reading at the end of John. Uh, it's exactly two weeks before Christmas. You guys all know that. You said two weeks from the day, it's Christmas. It's the celebration of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and uh, you can feel it. I, I've talked to several teachers this week. They can feel it. The kids are feeling, you know, they, there's a feeling now that goes with the Christmas holidays. We sometimes call it Christmas spirit, right? And uh, the Christmas spirit is just one of those things, you, it's there. Some of you would say you have it, uh, but you can't grab it. You can't see it. You can't define it. It's just there. You have Christmas spirit. How many of you are in the Christmas spirit right now? A little bit. All right. Well, let me help you out a little bit. The rest of you Scrooges, how, welcome to Christmas. <laughs> What's going on? It's like 100 people like, Bleh, whatever. It's Christmas. I just got sad a little bit. I'm going to sing loud for everyone to hear to bring Christmas cheer. I'm in church and I'm singing. <laughs> you need some Christmas spirit, people, all right? You can measure it. You, you can't see it. You can't touch it. You can't taste it. You can't define Christmas spirit. But you can measure it. Now, some of us, we measure it by the kind of clothes we wear during this. If you've got a sweater or a dress with, with bells on it, you've got Christmas spirit, all right? If you, uh, if you wear red and green all the time, there's a lot of red. I mean, I'm the same way. If you've got a, a tie that's Christmas, you've got Christmas spirit, all right? If you have a Santa Claus hat, there's a Santa Claus hat right over here. This, this young lady has Christmas spirit, all right? Uh, if you have elf ears, you might have a problem. But anyway, <laughs> if you have elf ears, you have Christmas spirit. You can tell it's Christmas spirit by the way that we just kind of dress this time of year. We get excited about all the stuff Christmas. You can tell it's Christmas spirit by all the songs that we sing, Jingle Bells and Rudolph and all the kids' songs. And all. For some reason, I've got Marshmallow World running through my head. I don't know why, but uh, we, we have songs and we have movies. That we, don't watch, we don't watch some of the movies we're watching right now. We don't watch them all year round, but we watch It's a Wonderful Life, and we watch, you know, The Christmas Story, and we watch... You know, uh, Christmas Vacation and, and Elf and Charlie Brown Christmas and Rudolph. And you know you have the Christmas spirit when you start feeling that these are fun, warm feelings to watch. If your mom or you are baking cookies or decorating trees or hanging lights, um, you know you have the Christmas spirit. There's another way that we can tell Christmas spirit exists. Is that at this time of year we seem to be more giving or more willing. It happens in charitable organizations some of you have probably given something to somebody at charity. Somebody's asked you for some money. Maybe you've thrown some money in Salvation Army. Of course, that happens at church too. Uh, December is the most giving month of the year at Eastview Christian Church. It's that way for every church. Why is that? Because there's this, this sense that says, oh, God gave us a baby, and he was Jesus, and we should give to other people. Great gift. In fact, let me just take a, a, a slight commercial here to talk about our upcoming offering next week. Now, if you're visiting today, you're like, oh, that's weird. He's talking about offering. Hey, don't give anything. It's fine. Okay? We're good. We want to we share the gospel and the love of Jesus with you. But if you're a member, I'm going to ask you to do two or uh, three simple things. Okay? We've been talking about this. I know they announced it earlier, but I want to make sure we're on the same page. These are simple faith steps. Everybody in here who's a member of Eastview Christian Church, you can do this. Okay? Uh, we're going to take up an offering next week. It's called the Expanding Ministry Offering or on Christmas Eve, three simple steps. Choose a number. I just choose, chose five. Maybe you have more commas or zeros in your number. I don't know. Five dollars. I want to give five dollars to the cause of Eastview Christian Church and what they're doing here and throughout the world. Okay? Then I'm going to add to that. I'm going to make some kind of sacrifice. I'm not going to do uh, Starbucks for two weeks. I'm not going to buy Christmas presents this week. I'm, I'm going to cut back on the Christmas presents that I buy my kids. I'm going to spend less. I'm going to put off buying a new car. Whatever it is, I'm going to sacrifice something. So I come up with another number. I'm going to save $25 by not eating out, all right? And then I'm going to add this. This is the greatest faith step. You simply, I double dog dare every one of you in here to pray this prayer. Dog, uh, double dog. I mean, like, seriously. I don't even know what that means. Like two dogs instead of one. Whoa. But pray this prayer, God, if you give me money that I wasn't counting on, unsuspected, out of the blue, miraculously, I'll give it to this offering. I promise you, every year we have dozens of stories. People are like, I got a refund I wasn't expecting. I got some money from some relatives I wasn't expecting. And all of a sudden, this becomes whatever it is, and then you just give joyfully on that day, and then that's the offering. That's the expanding ministry offering. And I'm just, I'm just saying, this is the time of the year when we do that. 
We have Christmas spirit through giving. We have Christmas spirit through our clothes and through our um, songs and through uh, the movies we watch. Um, by the way, I want to share this with you. It's really cool. The staff and the elders are, are in, okay, for this special offering. They've already committed $78,000 to this offering before we even take it. I just want to let you guys know we want to lead by example. So $78,000. The same people with Christmas spirit are clapping. Good job. Good. But as we consider Christmas spirit, we go back to our holiday meal from 2,000 years ago. Remember last week we, we, we said Passover was like Christmas to them. It was their holiday. And here we are in chapter 15 of John again. We're in the middle of Passover. And Jesus is not talking about Christmas spirit. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. And the Passover spirit is not this thing that they felt during Passover, but it's the spirit of God that Jesus is talking about. And so we're going to shift from Christmas spirit to the Holy Spirit, and we're going to learn what Jesus says about it during this holiday season at this holiday meal. So John 15, uh, we're going to begin in verse 26 and read through 16, verse 15. All right? You all ready? The word of the Lord. When the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you will remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send them to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they don't believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father, and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will, he uh, hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit of God to move us through the word of God today. God, I pray now that you would do the miracle that I ask you to do every Sunday, that beyond all the stuff we're thinking about and all the plans we have, that all, all the Christmas spirit, that you would come and overcome it by your Holy Spirit. You would touch every heart here, that you would make every heart here feel your presence, your Holy Spirit presence. God, I, I, I'm, I'm going to declare your son Jesus Christ. I know you're going to come in this message because... You always back up Jesus by your Holy Spirit. And so would you come now, Father, work in a miraculous way. We ask that you would change us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, like Christmas spirit, the Holy Spirit's kind of hard to comprehend. It's hard to put into a box. It was hard for these 12 to understand. Imagine this. The 12 followers of Jesus didn't fully understand the Holy Spirit. So guess what? 2,000 years later, you and I who read the story and understand Jesus and his story through the scripture, it's hard for us to understand the Holy Spirit. So if you're here today and you don't fully understand the Holy Spirit, that's okay. Because the Holy Spirit is not like Jesus. We can point to Jesus, a historical person. We can point to God the Father who lives in heaven and created it all. But the Holy Spirit is, well, uh, he's not tangible. He's spiritual. He, he moves in the spirit realm, and so therefore we can't have a picture of him. Now, if you're not a Christ follower here today and you're freaked out by the whole Holy Spirit thing, this is the moment where you look at your friend and go, oh, okay, here it comes, crazy Holy Spirit stuff, okay? We're not gonna handle any snakes today. We're not drinking any, any kind of poison. We're not gonna speak in tongues. But because here's the deal. Throughout the history of the church, the church has sought the miraculously weird. We, we just like weird stuff. We want the Holy Spirit to do weird stuff. But in, in doing that, sometimes we make the Holy Spirit weird to people. So my, my job today is to say, what did Jesus say about the Holy Spirit? He's, the, he's, the, he's the, the Son of God should know about the Spirit of God. 
And if he does, then let's, let's hear what he says, and he's going to tell us what the Holy Spirit does. I'm going to, going to give you a warning here up front. I'm going to give you a bunch of instruction about the Holy Spirit from the Word of God. God's going to move in that by his Spirit. And then I'm going to say, here's how you feel the Holy Spirit. Because I know everybody here is going, I want to feel the Holy Spirit. But just like Jesus in the miracle spe- uh, series, Jesus said, I'm not coming to do miracles tricks for you guys so you guys are impressed. I do them for a purpose. The Holy Spirit's the same. He doesn't move in us so we can go, oh, the Holy Spirit was there. He moves to do certain things, and that's what we're going to learn about today. So who is the Holy Spirit? Here's the first two questions I want to answer. Who is the Spirit, and why do we need him? I want you to notice that I didn't say, what is the Spirit? Preachers, uh, leaders, teachers, even this preacher in the past has referred to the Holy Spirit as an it. The Holy Spirit's not an it. The Holy Spirit is a who. Not a who from Whoville, but he's he's a person, all right? He's a human. uh, he's He's the person of God. There are three, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There are three unique personalities and yet one God. I don't have time to explain the Trinity. I'm trying to explain all about the Holy Spirit, which is way simpler. That's sarcasm, by the way. (laughs) Jesus gives us some insight into, into who this Holy Spirit is. What is he going to do? What is he about? Number one, we find this word four times, and I didn't read these other passages, uh, but there's five times he talks about the Holy Spirit in this meal, okay? And he calls him this certain name. The word is helper. So if you go back to John 14, John 14, 16, it says, he will give you another helper. You see, it's in capital letters in most of your Bibles. He also goes in, in uh, 14, 26, but the helper, right? And then he goes in 15, 26. We read this earlier. When the helper comes, in 16, verse 7, the helper What's this word helper mean? Some of your Bibles, some of your translations in English have comforter or encourager, all right? It's the Greek word, and and I'm only sharing this because this Greek word is so awesome. It's the word parakletos, para, beside, kletos, to call. I call you beside me. Jesus is telling us the Holy Spirit is a call beside guy. I'm going to stand next to you. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to be with you. And actually, in the first century, this parakletos phrase was used, or word was used in the courtroom. I am going to defend you. Some of you guys in your, your Bibles will have the word advocate. The Holy Spirit's an advocate. He's a helper. He's a comforter. He's an encourager. He's there. This is a great message in a world that's so lonely, isn't it? The helper, he's going to be here with you guys. Uh, he also says something else about, the, so whoever the Holy Spirit is, he's going to help me. I like that. I need help. Okay, some of you know that more than others, right? Uh, he's also the spirit of truth. Look in John 14, 17. He calls him the spirit of truth. If you want to circle it, that's important. Again, in the passage we read in John 15, 26, he's the spirit of truth. In, in chapter 16, verse 13, there it is. It's circled in my Bible because I was preaching today, and I circled it. But it's spirit of truth, right? So whatever we want to make the Holy Spirit, whoever we want him to be, he's always about the truth. He's going to tell the truth. He's a helper. He's here to help us, and he's going to tell us the truth all the time. I like that. So far, Holy Spirit's a good guy. I like the truth. I like people shooting straight with me, and I like somebody who's going to help me out. Uh, you know, you might recall in Scripture that Jesus, in fact, in this very meal, in, in uh, John 14, Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. So which is it? Is Jesus the truth, or is the Spirit of truth? Yes. They both are. That's why you see such a close relationship between Jesus and and Spirit. Because wherever Jesus is, where truth is, the Holy Spirit's there. That's why when Jesus is baptized, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Who shows up? Holy Spirit. Yes, yes, that's true. He shows up in the form of a dove. You guys know that, all right? And then, finally, let's just see his, his, his proper name of the third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Look in chapter 14, verse 26. Jesus is talking about him. But the helper, the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that. I mean, if if you're old school like me, it's the Holy Ghost. I was always, like, like frightened by the ghost. We had Casper the Friendly Ghost back in the 1900s, but we had a cartoon. But, okay, I kind of saw him as a friendly ghost. But he's a spirit. That word many of you know in the Greek language is the word pneuma. You can hear it in our word pneumonia. The word for spirit in the New Testament, pneuma, means wind or breath, I can illustrate for you the Holy Spirit. (sighs) That's the Holy Spirit. He's the wind, the breath of God. And, uh, And that's what makes him so mysterious. 
Remember, in Nicodemus, the super smart guy that we'll study later in this series in John chapter 3, when Jesus is explaining to him what he doesn't understand about the kingdom of God, he says, don't you get this? You have to be baptized by the water and the spirit. And he's like, you know, Nicodemus is given that like, uh, spirit, I don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, the spirit of God, Nicodemus, is like the wind. We don't know where it's coming from. We don't know where it's going. We can't stop it. We can't touch it. We, we can only experience it, the wind. He must have been talking about Bloomington Normal, right? Because it's changing all the time, right? The, the, the spirit moves a lot in Bloomington Normal. But that's the wind of God. The Holy Spirit is like the wind of God, the unpredictable and uncontrollable but undeniably felt breath of God that carries us around. So far, I like the Holy Spirit. He helps me. He's telling me the truth. And he moves powerfully in my life like the wind. I love that. But how do we know... Uh, but why do we need him? That's a question. Why do we need him? Well, for these 12, it was really easy. Jesus is going away. Chapter 14, verse 25, he says, these things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you. Jesus has been with them for three years. If you have a God question, you just say, hey, Jesus, I've got a question. And he answers it. If you want to wonder who Jesus loves, you just watch him love people. If you wonder what Jesus cares about, you just watch him. Well, where's Jesus going? Well, let's just follow him. Following Jesus in these three years was very tangible, very personal, very human. But Jesus says, I'm leaving now. Look in verse 4 of chapter 16. We read it earlier. Uh, and, and, and into verse 5. Uh, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me. And none of you ask, where are you going? I'm going back to God. And since I'm leaving, you're not going to have me around to ask questions anymore. I've got to send you another helper. I've got to send you one like me who's connected to God who will give you the insight into what God wants you to do. And so um, that becomes valuable for us because, um, spirit-filled child, uh, <laughs> it, becomes, it becomes important for us because 2,000 years later, we never walked with Jesus. We call ourselves at these few fearless Christ followers, but we never really stepped in his sandal prints. How do we follow Jesus Christ? Because he sent his Holy Spirit to live in us. And, um, and that's how we understand it. We get excited this time of year, and we should. Christmas, Jesus born as a baby. We call it Emmanuel, God with us. My hope today is that you'll walk away going, oh, Christmas is awesome. But it's really more awesome that Jesus said, I'm going to send you somebody. So, you see, because Christmas is great, God with us. Passover is better, God in us. Wow, that's a different move. And that's what Jesus is saying is going to happen. The Holy Spirit of God is going to come live in you. Okay, so here's the million-dollar question, and you're all waiting, and you're wondering, how do we know that we have him? And what does he do? If, if this helper, truth-teller, uh, person that blows like the wind of, of God, how do we know that we have him? How do we know that he's working in our lives? Well, first of all, he's in us because Jesus promises he is. Just, you can circle these passages if you want to or write them down and look them up later. But Jesus says, I'm going to send you the Spirit. 14, 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you the Spirit. In 14, 26, the Father will send in my name the Holy Spirit. In 15, 26, he whom I send will, who proceeds from the Father, I'll send him. In 16, 7, but if I go, I will send him to you. Okay, so here, you just need to understand this. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit lives in you. If you've declared him Lord and Savior, I'm going to follow him, I'm going to obey him by faith, I understand Jesus to be who he is, then the Holy Spirit of God, you're like, how'd that happen? It just happens, okay? I can't explain it to you. Jesus promised it. So I, first of all, I just got to go, well, Holy Spirit lives in me because Jesus said it would by faith. In fact, it's the distinguishing mark in the New Testament of a, a Christian, a Christ follower. Romans 8, 9 says this, that we are not in the flesh, but we're in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, and anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to Christ. Galatians says it this way, that you receive the spirit by hearing with faith. And so we accept Jesus Christ by faith and say, I'm going to obey him and follow him. Holy Spirit comes and moves in. So if you're here today, good news, the Holy Spirit lives in you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. We have his presence. We have his truth. We have the breath and wind of God breathing through us all the time. Um, but here's the deal. If you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, I just got to be honest with you and say the Holy Spirit is not living in you. The Holy Spirit still works on you. In fact, if you pay attention, he's working on you right now. If you're visiting, somebody drug you here, and you're like, oh, I'm in church. Oh, so far the ceiling hasn't fallen in. Pay attention because he's, he's moving in you. He's moving you. 
He doesn't live in you yet. Okay? 14, 17 gives us this insight into what the Holy Spirit's all about. I love this. Chapter 14, verse 17. Uh, uh, well, yeah. Even, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him. Look at this word. For he dwells with you and will be in you. That word dwell, meno, means to move in. To move next door, move into the neighborhood. And if you pay attention to the whole history of the Bible, the whole history of the Bible is God saying, I want to get close to humans. These are the people I love. I created them in my image. I want to get closer to my creation. The garden, I've created this incredible garden. Adam and Eve, let's hang out. Let's walk in it. Let's talk in it. Let's be there in the cool of the evening. They sinned. They moved out. God says, okay, covenant, Moses, I'm going to be with you guys. I'm going to travel with you through the desert. I'm going to go on a 40-year camping trip with you. I'm going to be the tent in the middle of the campsite. I'm with you. You know, rejection. Later, I'm going to raise up King David. King David, you're going to be my guy. I'm going to establish Jerusalem. I'm going to live in your city. You, I will get an address. There's my house, the temple. You can see it. Rejection. Then in time and space, we celebrate this time of year. God says, okay. I'm not going to live in a tent. I'm not going to live in a house. I'm going to live in a human being. I'm going to pour myself into a baby, and I'm going to be God with you. I love you so much. I'm going to be like you so that you can be near me. And, of course, they rejected Jesus. And because of his death and his burial and resurrection, God now says, you know what? Here's the deal. I'm moving in. I'm not moving into your town. I'm not moving into your campsite. I'm not moving into your city. I'm moving into you by the Holy Spirit. I would suggest to you there's, no, there's nothing closer than being inside us. It reveals the heart of the Father. By the Father's plan and the Son's work, we have the Spirit of God living in us, and this is how we know we can know him. Now, so far, this is all head knowledge, and if you're visiting today, you're going, wow, this is kind of teachy. I feel like I'm in a class somewhere, and I'm getting all these facts about the Holy Spirit, and some of you are dissatisfied because you're going, I'm a churchgoer. Come on, pastor. How do we really know? I want to feel him. I want to see him do stuff. I want to prove that he's existing, and many of us want to experience the Holy Spirit's power, and much of the great stuff that's happened in the Scripture and in the church history has been astounding out there Holy Spirit power. But what if I told you that experience the Holy Spirit's presence is not always spectacular? I want you to hear this. And, and you may not know this. The history of Eastview Christian Church, we're a restoration movement. You can Google it. And you can find a bunch of weird stuff about us. But back in our history, uh, in, in the revivals in Ohio and Kentucky and, and Indiana, very plain people who were settling America is the roots of the restoration movement. And there were some movements of the Holy Spirit, people who were doing crazy things possessed by the Holy Spirit. In fact, you guys may not know this, but Quakers and Shakers come from this. Why do they call them Shakers? Because that's, the Holy Spirit takes over, they start shaking, right? Quaking, the same thing, all right? Uh, people were holy laughter, speaking in tongues. And, and I'm not, I wasn't there. I don't know if those were real or people just flipping out. I don't know what's going on. What I do know is the Holy Spirit can and does do all the things. He's done those things in Scripture. Uh, but what I want to say to us today, if you're here is to, listen, the Holy Spirit does not always do spectacular stuff. He's in the everyday. He's spectacular in everything. He's not always spectacular, though. We feel the Holy Spirit by paying attention to what he came to do. And so here's what I want to encourage you to do today. If you want to feel the Holy Spirit, let's look at what Jesus says he does. Number one, Jesus says that the Spirit bears witness to Jesus. So here, here's, if you want to feel the Holy Spirit, bear witness about Jesus. Look at it in the end of, of John 15, uh, 26, we read it. The Holy Spirit comes, I will send him to you, the Father, the Spirit of truth. He will bear witness about me. Okay, well, I'm not, I'm not very smart, but I can figure this out. If he bears witness about Jesus, that means then in verse 6, 27, you also will bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. If I bear witness, if I speak about Jesus, the Holy Spirit's going to be there. He's just going to show up. That's not manipulating the Holy Spirit. This is a reality. Jesus, the Holy Spirit is just flying all over the world all the time going, oh, there's Jesus, yes, yes, just Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He's all over it because he's giving witness to it. He's bearing witness to Jesus as the Son of God and the Savior of the world. If you go to heaven, we've seen some of these scenes in Revelation. Guess who's there? The Holy Spirit going, Jesus. He's all over it. You speak the name of Jesus Christ. If you want to feel the Holy Spirit, you want to feel the Holy Spirit move in your life, then we as Christians have to get better 
that's speaking. You know, he says in this passage, he says, hey, guys, you're not going to believe it. First three verses here, you're not going to believe this, but they're going to put you out of the synagogue. You guys are good Jewish boys, but they're not going to let you come in and worship anymore. They're going to persecute you. In fact, they're going to kill you. They're going to think it's serving God by killing you because you're preaching Jesus. But don't worry because the Holy Spirit's going to help you bear witness. And then in Acts 5, uh, 32, you should look at this later. It's really cool. Peter is talking to these, these guys who are trying to kick him out of the synagogue and kill him and persecute him. And he goes, we are witnesses to these things, talking about Jesus. And listen to this. And so is the Holy Spirit. In other words, Peter understood very clearly as he's talking to the, to the, the leaders of the, of the first century um, uh, Old Testament group of people. He, he, he's just going, hey, listen, I'm telling you about Jesus, and guess what? The Holy Spirit is dancing all over this, man. You guys pay attention. The Holy Spirit is bearing witness in your life, and if you want to feel the Holy Spirit presence of God, you bear witness with him. The Holy Spirit is in the world today to convict the world of sin. Look in verse 8, okay? The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. When he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So if you're here today and you're outside of Jesus Christ, you're not a follower of Jesus Christ yet, we're praying for you. We hope that you will become a follower because we found life and good news in him. But if you're not a follower of his yet, he works in your life to convict you, sometimes through the friends that you're sitting next to, sometimes by sitting in a Sunday morning worship service. And the Holy Spirit's moving in ways. Because the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. Look what he says in verse 9. He convicts of sin because they don't believe in me. The Holy Spirit is constantly, if he's bearing witness to Jesus, saying, if you don't follow Jesus, your way is wrong. Holy Spirit's convicting the world of sin. I used to tell this to teenagers when I was a youth pastor back in the day. I'm like, hey, you can do anything you want. Just pray and ask God and thank him for it. What are you going to do? I'm going to go get drunk with my friends on Friday night. Thank you, God. No, the Holy Spirit's not going to let you pray that prayer. He's going to convict you. You can't utter that, right? Holy Spirit works in all of our lives. We call it a conscience sometimes, but I believe it's the Holy Spirit of God moving in our lives to convict us of sin and, and who Jesus is. It convicts us of righteousness it, it, because Jesus is the righteous one has now gone to the, uh, gone to the Father, verse 11. It, it, the Holy Spirit convicts us. That's the right thing to do. You need to do that. And the Holy Spirit convicts us in judgment, verse 11. Satan is defeated. Look what it says. He, he, Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. What's that mean? How's, how's the rule of this world going to be judged? Because Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection says, Satan, you lose. Death and sin have no hold over my people. You lose. And if we associate ourselves with Satan, then we lose as well. One other thing the Spirit does. The Spirit guides us in truth. Um, look in verse uh, 13, chapter 16. When the Spirit of truth comes... He will guide you into all truth. For he won't speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears me uh, hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Remember what Jesus has said his entire ministry? He's going, I'm not making this up. This is from the Father. I'm saying what I hear because we're one. The Holy Spirit's the same. The Holy Spirit's not coming and saying, hey, Jesus, he was cool, but I got some new stuff for you. The Holy Spirit moves in and says, hey, you know what? Here's the deal. I'm going to say everything that Jesus said because Jesus is truth and I tell the truth and I'm going to back it up. He's going to guide us in truth. If you want the truth today, let the Holy Spirit guide you. Uh, uh, chapter 14, verse 26, if you want to look at this later, the Spirit is a teacher. He reminds us of the teachings of Jesus Christ. We'll talk about this in just a moment. Now, if all of this is true, okay, you guys are all sitting there going, Whew, what a sermon. Right? That's a lot of stuff I've told you about the Holy Spirit. Um, but if all of this is true, I've said all of this about the Holy Spirit, what he does, then there are four basic ways that you and I can experience him in our lives. There's four ways that I'm telling you, you can walk away and go, I've experienced the Holy Spirit. I'm going to write them up here. There are four W's uh, just because hopefully that will that'll, uh, help us remember them better. All right? Witness. Work. Word, worship. Again, the Holy Spirit's the wind of God. I want to say very clearly, I have no control over him. We do pray. Sometimes I look at people like with this eye, it's like when they pray this prayer. Holy Spirit, come and do whatever you want. And I'm like, you sure? Because sometimes that's tongues of fire. Sometimes that's an earthquake. Sometimes that's people dropping dead. You sure? God, 
Do whatever you want in this place today. Well, here's the deal. He doesn't need my permission. He's going to. Holy Spirit moves as he wants to. He's the wind. I can't control him. I can't predict him. I can't make him do anything. We pray every week as we come to worship, God, move by your spirit in this place. But we can't make the songs that happen or the sermon that happens to make that happen. We don't control the Holy Spirit of God. But I can tell you this, based on Jesus' testimony about the Holy Spirit that's coming to help us, then we can do these things and have him show up in our lives. Listen, here's the deal. I know often we want to look for the Spirit in different ways. Okay? We want to see the spirit in some cloud formation. I mean, I've heard, I mean, I've heard people, Pastor, I've been praying about this, blah, blah, blah. And then I looked up and there was a cloud that looked like a dove. And so I knew that that's the person I was supposed to marry. And I'm like, or maybe it's just a cloudy day and, and you're seeing things. I don't know. Right? People have prayed about something. Pastor, for the last three weeks, I, every night at 444, I wake up at 449 and it means this. And I'm like, you might have insomnia. It just may be insomnia, right? Or, you know, I've been praying, I've been praying. I prayed for something a week. I'm looking down at my alphabet cereal, and it says yes. So I think God wants me to buy the car. I'm like, you're staring at a bowl of cereal. Right? We, and again, I, I want to make sure you understand clearly. God, I've seen God work in miraculous ways out there. But mostly he works in the same old ways over and over again based on who he is. He works in the witness of Jesus Christ. If you want to experience the Holy Spirit of God, then take a step of faith and begin talking to your friends about Jesus. Take a step of faith and don't hide who you are as you follow him. Take a step of faith and invite somebody um, to Christmas Eve services. Take a step of faith and pray this prayer. I pray this prayer a lot in public, and I always don't really want God to answer it. Let's be honest. But I pray this prayer a lot. Holy Spirit of God, I'll represent Jesus to you, uh, uh, to someone if you want me to. Open the door. I I'm telling you, you pray that prayer, it's uncanny how many times you find yourself five minutes later talking about Jesus because the Holy Spirit goes, oh, you'll talk? Sweet. Talk to that person. And all of a sudden that person walks up to you and you're in the middle of a Jesus conversation and you had no, you don't have to get in. You know, so many times we were, I don't know how to witness, I don't have to start the conversation. Just ask the Holy Spirit. Tell the Holy Spirit, I'm available, I'll talk for Jesus if you do it. And he'll do it. I felt him many times miraculously work in that prayer. And then we, we work. You want to feel, feel Jesus? By the way, 1527 is where I kind of get this. Look at 1527, the whole idea of witness. You will also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. If we are his witnesses and what he does as the Holy Spirit is witness, then he's going to witness through us. He's going to show up. All right? We also do it in the work. Look in 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. And you're sitting there going, it can't be to our advantage that you leave, Jesus. You're the Messiah. Even today, most of us in here are going, man, it'd be easier to be a Christian if Jesus was here. But Jesus refutes that. Jesus says, nope, it's way better that you don't have me, that you have the Holy Spirit. In, in fact, in chapter 14, verse 12 of John, he says this, that by the Holy Spirit, you're going to do greater works than I did. He's Jesus, and he's saying that in the Holy Spirit's power, you and I will do greater works than him. Why? Because we get to declare the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And if we pay attention, the Holy Spirit will show up when we do work in his name. The reason that we love, imagine, that we celebrate it again today that we, that we did last week, the reason we love serving in the food pantry, the reason we love serving in the different ministries of the church, because when you serve in Jesus' name, the Holy Spirit shows up. The, the, you, again, if you were here last week during Imagine, you walk down the hall, you feel it. There's something tangible. It's not Christmas spirit. It's the Holy Spirit of God moving in the work of the people of God in the name of Jesus. And when we work like that, guess what? If you shovel your, your neighbor's driveway in the name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit's going to be there. He's going to show up because he loves to do work in the name of Jesus. When you serve a shut-in or you work at a, a shelter or a soup kitchen, when you give to someone who's not expecting it, then the Spirit shows up. I suspect one of the reasons we love Christmas so much is because we pay attention to serving and working in the name of Jesus more than any other time of the year. We go, oh, that feels good. It's the Holy Spirit. Third work is the word of God. I don't need to tell you what I think about this, but I will. 
the Word of God, Jesus Christ, the living Word of God, as taught to us and explained to us and, and moving through the Word, the written Word, the Bible, is what moves the Holy Spirit in our lives. Okay? Why do I preach every Sunday? Because I believe that when I declare Jesus through biblical preaching, the, the Word of God, the Holy Spirit of God comes and he moves. And if you're paying attention right now, I, don't, I know people don't come to church every Sunday going, can't wait for a 35-minute speech. Woo, this is going to be awesome. Now, some of you do. Okay? You love the Word of God. The Lord's helped you. But, but most people come to church discouraged, distracted, disengaged, disinterested, disbelieving. And every Sunday, I'm, and, and you go, why would you talk to those people? Why would I talk to people who don't care? They're looking at their scores on their phone. They're, they're flipping. They don't care. Why am I talking to you right now? Here's why I'm talking to you right now. Because I believe the Holy Spirit of God is saying something to you right now. And here's why. Because I'm declaring the word of God. Every Sunday, I'm not exaggerating, every Sunday, somebody comes to me via email or a phone call or in the family room and says, your sermon was from me today. And I go, huh, Holy Spirit wrote it. I'm just talking. And I'm telling you, there are times, you know how, I, 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 listen, I'm, I'm average intelligent. I'm not dumb. I'm not smart. I'm just that guy, right? I study. But there's times when I'm preaching, I say such brilliant stuff. It's so awesome. As I'm preaching, I'm going, man, that is so good. <laughs> it's not my notes. The Holy Spirit moving doing what he does, because when you, when you speak the word of God, the Holy Spirit moves when you're in the word of God. Can I encourage you, Christians, if you want to feel the Holy Spirit, just read the Bible. Just say, Spirit, speak to me, and read it, because when you do, the Holy Spirit of God says, yes, the word, and he convicts us, and he moves us. And then, of course, in worship, I don't need to tell you this, why I think you should come to church every Sunday is because you need to worship with other people. I mean, it's really simple math. If I get several, several people that are filled with the Holy Spirit, declaring through song and baptisms and communion the word Jesus Christ, guess where the Holy Spirit is? Here. And if you were today and you're a visitor and you're going, I don't get the whole song thing, and we say this all the time, you don't have to sing all the songs. Here's what you should do if you're a visitor. You should look at somebody who believes it and go, why are they saying that? Because in the midst of our testimony and our worship and our singing and our praising Jesus, which we've done today, the Holy Spirit shows up. See, during this holiday season, I hope you feel much more than the Christmas spirit. I hope you have Christmas spirit. I like this season. But during this season, I hope that you feel the spirit that Jesus promised during a holiday meal 2,000 years ago. The Holy Spirit. The holiday spirit of Christmas is God with us but the holiday spirit of Passover is God in us and I love the manger I love a baby born in Bethlehem that's so cool but it's way more cool that God lives in me he lives in you and so Christmas spirit doesn't have to go away two weeks from now this January we'll still be preaching God with us in the power of the Holy Spirit God in us because the spirit of the baby who was born king is here now in us if you pay attention you probably heard him today let's pray God I thank you for a chance to share your word thank you for um, your Holy Spirit that lives in us and I, I, I just believe what I'm getting ready to ask and say God would you, by your Holy Spirit now, move with us out into the parking lot, out into the atrium, uh, into our homes, into our work week and our lives. Holy Spirit, take the words that I've spoken and, and be present in the work that you're doing in our lives. Encourage us today. Help us. Show us the truth. God, move by your Holy Spirit power and wind and breath of God ways today. Thank you, Father, for this time to be together. I pray your blessing on these people. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Have a great week. See you next Sunday.